Artificial intelligence will completely transform our world. But what is AI? Why will it affect you? And how can you and your business survive and thrive through the AI revolution? Welcome to AI and You. Here is your host, author, speaker, and futurist, Peter Scott. Hello and welcome to episode 35. We're going to finish the interview with Michael Waldridge. He is a professor and head of the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oxford. He is an expert on multi-agent systems, more on those in this episode, and has published more than 400 articles about them, plus nine books, including the more popular Ladybird Expert Guide to Artificial Intelligence and The Road to Conscious Machines. He has been president of the International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, of the European Association for AI, and also president of the International Association for Autonomous Agents and Multi-Agent Systems, among many other distinguished credentials. His new book is A Brief History of Artificial Intelligence and has just now gone on sale. In last week's episode, we talked about Michael's reaction as an AI researcher of 30 years to the sensationalization of the rapid progress of AI in the last decade and explaining the foundations of AI at introductory levels. We have, of course, done that with several episodes and guests on this podcast, but I don't consider that at all repetitive because each of us has his or her own interpretation and verbalization of what AI is. And by giving you those multiple perspectives, we're giving you this stereoscopic vision, if you will, that lets you see it in 3D. In this episode, we'll move on to topics including the weaponization of AI, examples of bias in AI, and how basic differences between how AI works and how humans think can cause problems. Let's return now to the conclusion of the interview with Michael Waldridge. But I want to try and escape the gravitational pull of the conscious robot sure. question here for a bit. When you were talking about the media always wants to put a picture of the Terminator up when you do an interview. And Stuart Russell at Berkeley would say that he would get these interviewer requests and he'd say, I'll only do it on the condition that you don't run a picture of the Terminator with it. And, and they would say, all right, I'll, <laughs> well, take well it done, to, I'll take it to my bosses. And every time it would have a picture of the Terminator on here, he gave up. But mentioning Stuart there, aside from being the author of the most widely used textbook on AI, at least in North America, is also quite vocal about problems in artificial intelligence development, uh, specifically lethal autonomous weapons. And when I think about those, I start thinking about swarming kind of technologies, and then I'm into the realm of agents, multi-agent systems, and that's your territory. So yeah. talk about multi-agent systems, and does that intersect with weapons at all in your research? The short answer to the last part is absolutely no, we've never done any military research. So what is multi-agent systems about? So one of the dreams that we had, I had, and many other people had in, in the late 80s, early 90s, when I started my, my PhD, was the idea of what we called agents. And the idea of agents is that there's a piece of software, which is not just the dumb recipient of your instructions that's only waiting to be told what to do. It's actually taking the initiative, working with you actively in the same way that a human assistant, like your PA or whatever, would work with you or somebody that works with you on a project. So you use Microsoft Word. The things that happen on Microsoft Word happen because you click on an icon or you select something from a menu. It's just waiting to be told what to do. It's the dumb recipient of your instructions. If you leave it for a week and come back, it's still sat there patiently waiting what to do next. It's got no sense of the world that you're inhabiting or the task that you're trying to accomplish. So the dream that we had was, why can't we build software applications which are proactive, which can take the initiative, which can work with you actively on some task in the same way that a human being would do. So to lift software from just being the dumb recipient of instructions to something which is actively cooperating, working with you. 
And that dream was very current in the research community in the mid 90s. It took roughly 15 years for it to be realized. And it was realized. And it was realized through Siri and Alexa and Cortana and all of those other systems. And why are those agent based assistants uh, interfaces, we call them, right? I mean, for your, your smartphone, why are they so important? Because there's no sensible way of doing things otherwise. If you're going to interact with your house, you really want an agent-based interface. You want to be able to just say, turn the lights on in the in the top room and so on. You don't want to have to sort of sit down at a keyboard and type uh, some complex series of instructions. So the vision did get realized, but here's the thing. There's one part of the vision that we all thought, and I still strongly believe, must happen, which hasn't happened yet. And that part of the vision is the idea that my Siri will talk to your Siri. So what does that mean? You know, suppose I want to book a meeting with you, right? Uh, or we, you know, as we did a few weeks ago when we needed to schedule a time for this. Okay, so I could phone you up is one way of doing it. Or, you know, we've seen examples over the last few years where my Siri can phone you up, right? So my Siri could phone you up and say, I'd like to book a meeting with you. And there was a famous example, I think it was by Google of doing restaurant bookings, you know, Siri type systems that would phone up and converse with another human being to book a table in a restaurant. Oh, what a wonderful thing that would be right now. Okay, so, but why would Siri phone up you? Why not have my Siri just talk directly to your Siri and they can sort it out amongst themselves? That, in a nutshell, is multi-agent systems. The idea that I have a computer program, which is working for me, think of it as being like my personal assistant, my personal digital assistant, to use the phrase that was current in the 90s. You have your agent that's working for you. I can delegate tasks to my agent, which involve the two of you cooperating, coordinating, negotiating with each other, right? Which we might well do. You know, I have times that are convenient for me. You have times that are convenient for you. Maybe there's some give and take about the actual time of the meeting. That part of the puzzle, Siri talks to Siri, agents directly talking to other agents, and I say cooperating, coordinating, negotiating with them, that part of the puzzle hasn't yet been realized. And so that's what we are working on. Mm. And in the kind of computer science we were doing 20 years ago, we would be then looking to develop some sort of standardized protocol for inter-agent exchange and calendar standardization. But this has to go far beyond that. But I, yes, I definitely want something like my Siri talking to your Siri. When I had Audrey Tang, the information minister for Taiwan, on the show, and I asked her to speculate about what we might have in AI 10 years from now, she was talking essentially these terms of having a digital clone of ourselves that would be empowered to do this kind of negotiation, that Siri would have enough context about you to schedule meetings that you would actually want and not just respond to uh, every meeting request that came in or none of them, but it would have enough understanding, uh, there's that word again, of what you needed. It would learn enough to be able to act on your behalf. And that's very appealing. So the multi-agent systems you're describing, the multi-part of it is not that there are multiple agents all cooperating to solve the same problem, but there are multiple independent agents that interact with each other with different exactly. goals? Ah. Yeah, absolutely, exactly. And then the challenge is, if they've got different goals, then they need to be able to reach agreements with one another. And so, for example, there's a huge thrust of research on automated negotiation. How can two agents reach agreements with one another on matters of common interest? I mean, that's a big research challenge. There are specifically, I mean, I'm getting slightly technical, but I mean, the techniques that we use in our research uh, to try to analyze the interactions uh, and enable our agents to make the best choices on our behalf. That's exactly it. You've got multiple agents. They're not necessarily all programmed by the same person. I mean, that's, that's something that you could do, and that's a big part of the multi-agent systems work. But the general picture is that they've each got their own goals. How then are they going to interact with each other? Mm. I feel the gravitational pull again of the apocalypse, and these agents could easily be weapons. Not that you're developing that, not that you have any intention of developing that, but people who develop weapon systems could use this. So I guess as with all of these kind of technologies, I think that's certainly something that we would need to be aware of. I mean, you mentioned Stuart's concerns about these things earlier. There's a very simple scenario that Stuart gave about five or six years ago in that the concerns about lethal autonomous weapons were becoming prominent. And so the scenario goes like this. So he says, 
imagine one of these kind of little quadcopter helicopters, the kind that you can buy for sort of $50 from, you know, you buy them from a local toy store. Imagine something like that. And it's got a lump of explosive the size of a hand grenade. And it's got a small onboard computer with a camera. And it's got some intelligence. And the intelligence is just to explore some streets in a neighborhood, the streets of London or New York or Paris or Beijing or whatever. It just explores the streets and it's looking for a human form. It doesn't need to identify that person. It doesn't need to say that's Michael Waldridge. It just needs to identify a human form. And when it sees a human form, it just flies down and blows up. And so these are these would be weapons of terror. Um, I mean, they would be, as Stuart said, they would be cheap as chips. I mean, you know, you're talking the outlay for these would be a couple of dollars each. They wouldn't be much more than a regular hand grenade. And the slightly disturbing thing is that I think the technology to build those is basically available now. You just require the will to do it. And the, I emphasize the AI there is about sort of navigating through streets, recognizing a human form and just navigating down there. That's where the AI is and imagine, you know, thousands of those released on the streets of, of, of our cities. It would be a terrible, terrible, terrible thing. So that there are absolutely concerns. I mean, the good news is that there are also signs that governments are listening to these concerns. Not all governments, but uh, governments are listening. They're making the right noises. We have to make sure that they follow through, that you can see why these things would be tempting for the military. So, you know, this is a point at which actually this is exactly one of the reasons that I wanted to inform in my book, the debate, you know, forget about the robot takeover, super intelligence kind of dystopias. This is the kind of thing that you should be concerned about right now. And that's the Slaughterbots video yeah. that they produced and, and which yeah. you can find on YouTube. When I was thinking about ethics in artificial intelligence, it occurred to me that it's an extension of what we would call defensive programming that when we write programs, and famously when computers were first being used at scale for enterprises, there were umpteen stories about granny being charged $5 million for her electricity bill for the last month. And those have died out because we wrote safer programs, including exceptions and checks that said, don't bill someone living in a single house $5 million until you've had person check this and things like that. So Every software developer understands about defensive programming, exception checking, that you put in checks for things that you don't expect to happen, but you put them in anyway. And experience tells us that they'll get caught in any way. At some point, it will go wrong in the development, right? Version 3.0 or 1.0. Now, when we look at higher levels of abstraction in our programming, then we're creating systems that behave at higher levels of abstraction than the kind of exceptions are higher level exceptions, like it's not just a pixel going bad on a screen somewhere, but the drone decides to kill the wrong person. And in your students of artificial intelligence right now, what are the top ethical debates about how we should educate people to make safe artificial intelligence? Has it advanced beyond the defensive programming stage? Yeah, so this has been extremely active area over the last few years. And I say, I think the concerns were prompted by exactly the same sort of scenarios that it suddenly became clear that that computers were going to be capable of, for example, recognizing faces. And you can do lots of cool things with that, right? So, I mean, I have friends who think that keys will soon be a thing of the past because your door will just recognize your face and open for you. And that's, you know, that I guess that's sort of convenient and nice to have. But obviously also facial recognition, similarly, uh, raises all sorts of other challenges. Another example, lip reading. Um, so uh, lip reading software a couple of years ago, there were breakthroughs in, in lip reading software. And these were, I genuinely believe, developed with the best of intentions. I mean, to help people with hearing difficulties, but you don't have to think very far before you can think of all sorts of dubious applications of lip reading. So there's, there's been a flurry of debate and research around these topics. And I think the good news is that we are beginning to get a handle on a number of these things. So, I mean, the classic one is fairness, what is fair, fair decision making and bias in decision making and how does bias decision making in a computer program actually it doesn't need to be an AI program and just a computer program. How does that come about? What are the sources of that bias? But then I think also there's a, there are a number of other researchers, I mean, most famously Timnit Gebru, who are thinking much more about the human effects of that and the way that these technologies, if they are developed in a kind of naive way, can completely inadvertently 
disadvantage very, very large groups of society. So we saw an example of that last summer. So the the high school exams, secondary school exams in the UK were cancelled because of the pandemic. And famously, the decision was taking that there should be, you know, some semi-automated process to decide what the grades of these kids would be. And it went horribly wrong for very, very obvious reasons. I mean, so anecdotally, one of the rules that was embedded within this software was that if in a particular school, if on average that school had one student who failed physics, then this year somebody had to fail physics in that school. You know, just kind of kind of see the logic of it. But at the same time, you know, it's sort of a bit of a head thump. And there was an outcry and a backtrack. Now, that was probably more what I would say data science and statistics rather than AI, but the same lessons apply. So I think we've got a much better handle what those issues are. One thing I would say is you're worried about ethical AI. One idea is we can build machines which are capable of ethical decisions. I'm I'm somewhat skeptical about that. I mean, the famous one, the trolley problem. Oh, my God, I've mentioned the trolley problem. Shame on me. Uh, for mentioning the trolley problem. You know, so the, the trolley problem, in case, you know, your listeners don't know. I mean, so the trolley problem first posed in the 1960s. And the idea is there's a train hurtling down a track and the track forks. And if you don't do anything, then five people will be killed. But if you pull a lever, it will go, the train will go down another track and one person will be killed. And so the question is, should you pull the lever or not? Um And the reason that people got excited about this is they started thinking about driverless cars. And well, what happens if a driverless car has to make a decision like that? How should it go about making that decision? The problem is, I think that kind of, you know, the idea that we should then try and equip machines to sort of reason ethically about those those things, I think that's the wrong place. I I'm not interested in building ethical machines. I want people to be ethical. I want people to be accountable. I want the companies that deploy that technology to be accountable. You can't delegate your responsibilities as a, for ethics to a machine. I think that's just a kind of a, a mistake. I mean, it's fascinating stuff to think about building machines that can make ethical decisions. But my worry is that that you know, will be used as an excuse. Oh, the machine did it. It wasn't us. I want people and organizations to be accountable for the technology they release. I don't think they should be allowed to try to delegate that to a machine. Mm. And and that actually brings me on to transparency and explainability in artificial intelligence. You know, if I'm writing a classic computer program for industrial process control or something, and I come up with an algorithm and it's got, say, a couple of magic numbers in it, and someone says, well, where did you get that number? And, and that number, why are those in there? I say, I, I don't know, they just work. I would be excoriated for voodoo programming. But then if I deploy a neural network and let it pick a million magic numbers, suddenly I'm a genius. And the image recognition in particular, it looks on the face of it as though we've trained it to be as good as we are at recognizing, say, road signs. And yet then we find that it is very fragile because if you know what you're doing, you can add what looks like noise to that to make it recognize something completely different. It is nowhere near as robust as we are. In fact, I don't know if we've gotten even to the point yet where turning it upside down doesn't fool it completely if it's looking at a faces, for instance. So in one way, it looks like, oh, it's doing what the human brain does. Look, we have neurons or optic parts of our retina, cells in our retina that can recognize diagonal lines. There's a node in the network that does the same thing. Must be that the whole thing is doing that. And in another sense, no, it's very much more fragile. It's doing feature recognition on an entirely different way from what we would. What sort of problems are there? Do we have fundamental impediments to that kind of natural world understanding, perception, getting as good as we want? So you're exactly right. Neural networks are just a big long list of magic numbers that mean absolutely nothing to people. And large neural networks include millions and millions of these magic numbers. And and if you you ever get to scale to sort of human brain, then you're talking tens or hundreds of billions of magic numbers. And this is, I think, the defining problem of AI for the current age. We have technology which looks like it works but it is exactly a black box. It can't tell us why it does something. We can't look inside it and see reverse engineer why it did it. And also it's fragile in exactly the way that you you describe. You can take a road sign, put a few stickers on it, and suddenly you know your driverless car thinks it's a giraffe. And that's very, very worrying. And I think that should be a huge wake-up call for people that think that they can naively put these technologies into scenarios that matter for people. 
I mean, it doesn't matter in it. You know, if you're playing a computer game or something, you know, for recreational purposes, it doesn't greatly matter if it gets it wrong. But, you know, if it's making decisions that have consequences for people, you should really, really be concerned about this. A tiny tweak leads to a huge difference in the output. So, you know, human beings driving along and, you know, and it sees something on the side of the road that it thinks looks like a giraffe, right? I mean, immediately I conclude because of my experience in the world, that actually, no, there aren't any giraffes on the streets of Oxford. You know, that's, that's a mistake. I'm not going to worry about that. And again, I think this is an example where we have our experience of the human world. We are not just programs which have been optimized to take some input and produce some example. We have wealth of experience. And some of that experience was transmitted to us genetically. So after billions of years of reinforcement learning in the real world through mother nature, trial and error, getting things right, getting things wrong and so on until finally we arrive at us. And then, you know, in my case, 54 years of working in the human world where I've never seen a giraffe on the streets of Oxford. And these programs don't have that. They don't have that. I mean, and I know so Gary Marcus and Ernie Davis, who wrote another very nice book on rebooting AI, you know, they describe it as common sense. You know, the programs doesn't have the common sense to say, that's not a giraffe. You know, that thing that you've seen, that must be a glitch somewhere. They don't have that common sense. So another way of framing it is we're missing that common sense part of the equation. But In short, I mean, I have to say you're absolutely right. This is the defining problem, I think, for AI at the present time. To put it another way, these techniques work, but actually we don't understand how they work. The techniques themselves to train these, they work, but we don't have any deep theory to explain why they work or what the limits are or where those discontinuities happen, you know, where you just attach some tiny little things to an image and all of a sudden it changes its interpretation of it from road sign to giraffe. We're missing all those things. Many people are working on those and there are lots of leads, but there is no, I think, no magic fix in evidence at the moment. Mm. And I'll point out that your example of giraffe wasn't chosen randomly. It was Janelle Shane that pointed out that the Microsoft Azure image recognition network has a fetish for giraffes and sees them in all kinds of images where nothing like that exists. Somehow it was trained on a lot of pictures of giraffes. So what are your current areas of research? What are you excited about developing or seeing developed? So my current research is all focused around, uh, to go back to multi-agent systems, when we have AI systems that interact with each other, my system working for me, your system working for you. And these are, there are examples of such systems. So trading systems, automated trading systems, which make up a huge part of the global economy or computer programs, which you can think of as agents buying and selling automatically without human intervention. And they are prone to unstable dynamics. And famously in the case of what's called the flash crash on 6th of May, 2010, where over the space of 15 minutes, the Dow Jones index of industrial averages lost hundreds of billions of dollars, but then bounced back up in a similarly short period of time. And the joke at the time was, you know, if you'd gone to the bathroom or gone for a coffee break, you would have missed the whole thing. And that's very scary. I mean, so you way of thinking about that is if if that crash, and it's called the flash crash because it unraveled in just a period of minutes, whereas previous stock market crashes going back to Black Monday or Black Wednesday, whatever it was in the 80s, you know, that was a month long event. This happened in minutes because these computer programs, these agents are buying and selling on millisecond or even microsecond timescales. If the bottom of that trough of the crash had coincided with the end of the trading day on a Friday, it would have been a cataclysm for the global economy. You know, the, 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 the US markets wouldn't have been able to respond until nine o'clock on Monday morning. You know, the, it would have been a horrible, horrible, horrible thing. The financial equivalent of Skynet. <laughs> Uh, except without any driving mind, right? I mean, it's not becoming conscious or self-aware. This is just behavior which is emerging from these very simple interactions. And you don't have to think very hard about why it happens. It's because, you know, when prices go down, by and large, the thing to do is to sell. But then the effect of that, if large numbers of people are doing that, is that prices will go down further and you just get this spiraling feedback loop. So my research at the moment is about understanding those kinds of dynamics. And we approach this in two ways. One way we approach it is we do simulations. So we've had PhD students doing simulations with millions and millions of agents buying and selling, simulating the flash crash scenario using real world data and looking for the circumstances that can lead to those. 
and how you can intervene to prevent them or manage them when they do occur. And then that's one side of it, doing these large scale simulations. The other side is we view this sort of through, through the lens of game theory and game theory is the mathematics of interaction. And we try to view these systems in game theoretic terms and say, well, what, how can we analyze these behaviors in terms of game theory? And my dream is to be able to bring those two things together. That's what I would really like to do in my research. So it's about understanding the dynamics. If we succeed in building these agents that can really work with each other on our behalf, you know, how can we model their dynamics and understand their dynamics and make sure it doesn't go wrong? If that dream is fulfilled, what might you be doing in AI 10 years from now and what might the world of AI look like as a result? So that's a good question. I mean, I think the big, I mean, I've been working in on multi-agent systems for exactly 30 years, right? I started my PhD in 1989. And the, as with so many things in AI, the problem turns out to be way harder than you thought it was when you started out. I thought by now that vision would be realized. And I say the frustrating thing, the vision that we had of kind of, you know, agents interacting with one another, my agent interacting with yours. And the frustrating thing is we've got part of the vision. We have Siri and Alexa and Cortana, and they are manifestations of that dream, but only partial manifestations. And I, while I strongly believe the future is multi-agent, it's not clear that our dream is going to be realized in my working life. For the next 10 years in AI generally, we have seen tremendous achievements over the last few years, you know, pretty much every week or every month. Sometimes it felt like every day we've seen kind of what looked like breakthrough AI systems. DeepMind protein folding system announced, I think just before Christmas was a very nice example. I mean, a really, really hard problem, an important problem. If you can get that right, then, you know, you stand to make a real difference in the world. But let you, you need to caution yourself that actually we're also seeing unprecedented investment, right? So if we weren't seeing these results coming out, then something would be very badly wrong because people are chucking huge, huge, huge amounts of money at AI. So we should be seeing impressive results. The scale of investment is unprecedented. What I'm curious about is the core techniques underpinning deep learning based on neural networks. They're not new. They've been around for decades. They were originally proposed in the 1940s. So a brief sort of flurry of interest in the 60s, then a bigger flurry of interest in the 80s, and it died out again. And then this massive boom that we've seen over the last 10 years. The reason it died out in the 80s wasn't because the science was wrong, it wasn't because the algorithms were in any sense wrong, it was because basically neural networks hit the limits of computers at the time, right? Training them is expensive. Training these neural networks about what to do takes a lot of compute power. Computers of the 80s just weren't up to it. Well, we have masses and masses and masses of compute power right now, but it's not unlimited. So what I'm curious about is whether we're going to hit the limits of what we can do with computers right now. So I would not be at all surprised. You can buy more compute time, but there comes a limit to how much compute time you can throw at things. So I wouldn't be surprised if we began to see some kind of plateau in terms of capabilities. That doesn't mean that people are going to stop doing really cool things because we've got enough compute power and we've got enough rich techniques to carry on doing really, really, really cool things. But nevertheless, I wouldn't be surprised to see some kind of plateauing over the next decade or so. There may be improvements in algorithms. I've seen things recently about being able to train networks with many fewer examples than were expected to be required. But I may not be remembering enough of the details, but there were examples like that. And I think the other thing is then talking about it, that data is that even with the hardware to do the computation, the digital data didn't exist until maybe 2005 or so to do training. Like ImageNet would, took a large amount of work to dig up exactly. the first training examples. Now we have data everywhere. There's so much being gathered. Your examples of agents that I want to go back to, and you were talking about general agents, Alexa and Siri, this sort of consumer devices. Autonomous vehicles are also agents. And there are standards mooted, which I don't have much awareness of at the moment, for like vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure communication. So there's work going on what's called V2V and V2X communication so that not unreasonably, if my Tesla is going down the road and there's another Tesla ahead of it, they ought to be able to communicate with each other so they don't hit each other. That's a minimum. And so there is work going on, and I guess transportation standards bodies, maybe it's SAE, I don't know, for those kind of protocols. 
Are you aware of anything that happening about the agents that you're looking at when you mention like Siri and Cortana? Is there any sign that the people owning those might actually want them to talk to each other? I think there's a lot of compelling scenarios. I mean, go back to your connected vehicles example. I mean, the kind of thing that's been researched in the multi-agent systems community is the idea, for example, you've got a busy road intersection. Your car is approaching the road intersection. Can it book a slot or perhaps buy a slot on that busy road intersection? So you've got um, the road intersection becomes a market where, you know, if you're not in any hurry, well, I don't want to spend any money. You know, I'll just take my time to get through it. But you're in a hurry. Why not actually just pay for it to get through? But then also, can you design that market so that it achieves certain social ends, things that you might want it to do? So the problem of designing markets that our agents can inhabit has also been a really thoroughly explored one. And it turns out that you can design markets so that, for example, you can achieve what's called social welfare. You can maximize in a certain mathematical sense, which need not detain us here. You know, you can maximize the benefit of the entire society. So that kind of thing, which is very speculative at the moment, but nevertheless kind of points to stuff that might be possible in the future. I mean, I think with connected vehicles, there is a real hope that, you know, you might be able to make much better use of congested road intersections. You might be able to get much higher throughput at the moment because, you know, the current systems that we use, you know, traffic, traffic light type systems are just incredibly crude. They're not designed to optimize throughput. They're designed to optimize safety, right? Using a very, very, very crude thing. But if you can design protocols which will maximize throughput and at the same time guarantee safety, why wouldn't you? And now I emphasize that's really speculative work. That's, that's I think, is a, a long way in the future. But I think there's no reason why that shouldn't be done. And so that, you know, and that some of the fundam- people have done simulations of that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. my colleague Peter Stone at the University of Texas has done some work on that with some very nice demos of simulations of that kind of protocol. And I say, I think that points the way for what might be possible in the future, but it is a way in the future, I'm afraid. It does give me a vision of a freeway jam-packed with cars hardly moving, but one of them is zooming down at the speed limit because it's paid $1,000 for the trip and all the others get out of the way just in time. (laughs) And you have to, if you don't like that scenario, then you have to design the protocol so that it doesn't allow for that kind of thing. I say one of the interesting things about this area which is called mechanism design is that it's about designing protocols so that just assuming everybody tries to act in their own best interest and by everybody i mean these these software agents the agents that are acting us the car or whatever that actually you can get things that are socially good happening as a consequence that you're being allowed to maximize throughput and so on hmm. um, that's a kind of sort of technique that's being researched at the moment do you have industry partners or companies that you work with in this research yeah i emphasize i'm not working on connected cars but the work that we've done on flash crashes yeah we're working with jp morgan for example they're funding our research to understand these sort of multi-agent system dynamics excellent Well, this has been just a great conversation. I love doing this. It's why I started this podcast, because I I want to be able to ask these kinds of questions of people like you. And this has been just a feast. What would you like to say in conclusion to people who are thinking of entering the field, maybe someone that could end up as one of your postdocs down the road if you want to start cultivating that idea? Well, I think one of the things, I mean, the reason that I got interested in AI right from the very beginning is that it's the most endlessly fascinating subject. I I think of very few subjects that appeal to quite so many different disciplines. I mean, to really understand the history of AI and the kind of history that I talk about in my book, you know, there's bits of neuroscience, there's bits of logic, there's bits of economics, there's bits of philosophy, there's there's quite a lot of economics. You know, all of these different things, there's, there's an awful lot of philosophy and all of these different areas, as well as computers uh, behind all that. And I, I think of very, very few areas that touch on, you know, where so many different communities have something to say, something to contribute, um, something of value. And AI brings all of that together in a kind of a melting pot, which just makes it the most endlessly fascinating area that I know of. And your ideas about what is possible and how AI might be achieved and so on, the way that they evolve, you know, the way that they've evolved over the last 30 years from when I was brought up in a particular kind of orthodoxy of AI to where we are now, you know, it's a different, I look back on that and I can see 
I can see these ideas twisting and changing and things coming in, different ideas going out of fashion and so on. It's a fascinating subject to work on. And forget about sort of making yourself rich and, you know, all those those kinds of things. You know, kids, you know, there, there are stories that, you know, in Europe, uh, they do these surveys of teenagers. What do you most want to be when you grow up? And, you know, 20 years ago, it was I want to be a rock star or I want to be a footballer or an actor uh, or actress. Um, and now it's I want to be an AI researcher. And I think that's exactly right, but don't do it for the wrong reasons. It's not about getting rich. It's just because it's the most fascinating subject I know of. Oh, thank you. That was beautifully put. And what conveys itself in a podcast that wouldn't come across in a blog or text is the passion and the enthusiasm and the excitement that you have for this. And I'm sure that's going to be infectious for our listeners. Michael, thank you very much for joining the show. It was really a pleasure. Stay safe. That's the end of our interview. Michael said on Twitter, quote, forget the science fiction, the science fact is much more interesting, end quote. And that philosophy really comes out in his passion for AI, as you heard there, about how endlessly fascinating it is to him. That's the sort of excitement we aim to bring you on this podcast. In the last episode, we were talking about the current state of autonomous vehicles, and Michael said that no car was at autonomy level four or five. If you don't know what those are, the Society of Automotive Engineers, SAE, the same people who decided that some oil would be labeled as 5W30 or 10W20, came up with a number system for levels of vehicle autonomy to make it easier to talk about how capable any particular model is. I'll leave the full explanation to another time, but for now, I'll just say that a car designated as SAE Level 4 autonomy can handle a complete trip by itself under certain conditions of location or environment, and a level 5 car can handle a complete trip under any conditions and wouldn't need a steering wheel or pedals. Well, for today's AI headline, and in the I'll just leave this here category, in a report from the Engadget site, a company called AutoX has opened the first fully driverless robo-taxi service in Shenzhen, China, and they do call their service explicitly Level 4 slash 5. The demonstration video, which I'll link to from the show transcript, is obviously a company promo piece. But nevertheless, shows a young woman taking a ride around town in the back seat of a vehicle that, for the trip that you could see, was meeting the definition of Level 4 autonomy. Now, the roads that it was navigating were as near ideal as you could hope for in an urban setting. Very wide, multi-lane roads with landscaped medians, little traffic, few pedestrians, but not zero pedestrians, and the vehicle navigated around several of them. It also handled a difficult situation for an AV, that of going down a narrow two-lane street and finding a truck stopped in its lane. When you or I encounter that situation, we have to wake up, edge out into the opposing lane to see if it's clear to go past that truck on the other side of the street and get back into our lane before anything comes along in the other direction. And that's exactly what the Auto X taxi did. Yes, you can say with complete justification that it is operating only under a narrow set of ideal conditions, including having reserved pickup curb spaces. Nevertheless, those conditions are still broad enough to encompass a useful use case. The Chinese are reportedly building their new cities, which they're doing at a staggering rate, to be AV friendly, and that could accelerate the number of places where they are viable and useful. It could give China a competitive advantage in several areas, which might be why the city of Shenzhen was willing to grant this license to operate to Auto X. Perhaps the most impressive part of the video comes at the end, when the young woman gets out at her destination and the car, a modified Chrysler Pacifica bristling with cameras and lidars, drives off empty to find its next passenger. There's a long way to go before this is going to be possible in most places in the West that aren't similarly architected, although Silicon Valley is one place that does look like Shenzhen, but it's fairly amazing and encouraging that even this much is now possible. And it means that now one of the boundaries of this is not technology, but regulation, compliance, and oversight. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens in the West around that. Next week, I will be interviewing Steve Schwartz, 
a veteran AI researcher at Yale University and founder of several AI companies. His new book, Evil Robots, Killer Computers and Other Myths, The Truth About AI and the Future of Humanity, comes out this month. That's next week on AI and You. Until then, remember, no matter how much computers learn how to do, it's how we come together as humans that matters. That's all for this episode of AI and You. Please leave a rating and comment and share with your friends. Get the book Crisis of Control and see more videos and articles at AINU.net. That's A-I-A-N-D-Y-O-U dot net, where you can also send us your questions. Thank you for listening.